<laughs> I need to turn my uh, fucking um, <laughs> noise gag down a bit, I think. I had it Especially all turned up for something. Especially if you're going to be bringing that kind of to the podcast, <laughs> silly goose. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Is that the right one to do, or is it main? Let me let me play with this live on, on air. No, I don't think it is that. I think it's this one. Alrighty, that was Mixing the Audio with AJ. Um, I'm your host, AJ, and <laughs> that was an audio mix. And welcome along as well, simultaneously to the Cole Popsha podcast. I'm here with Richard. Hello, Richard. This is also, well, this is three things. This is playing with me, the audio mix. Give me a chance to say Sorry. hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is playing with the audio mix with AJ. It's also the Cult Popsha podcast and its film franchise, Fortnites, in which the two of us sit down and watch a different film franchise each fortnight and then get together to discuss so it. I don't get my own solo endeavor a evil endeavor, you could- perhaps. <laughs> you, you are welcome to uh, introduce whatever you want. This is freeform jazz. Free. So, do you want your own film franchise Fortnite's jazz? Yeah, yeah. Because because I never said that you that this had to be three shows. It's just that was all I made up. People so you're tend welcome to, stop to counting make it. when they uh, after three. What's the highest number you that. can count? <laughs> What's the highest number you can count the by just looking count? at it? Oh, sorry. Was there more than <laughs> Yeah, I reckon it's seven. It? I reckon if there's seven things, I have to count them. But any lower, I can just know by looking at them. The, there's there's actually like really interesting scientific stuff about this that like we we know what one looks like, we know what two looks like, we definitely know what three looks like. Even four onwards is like. Do you know what four of something looks like, or are you counting four that quickly? Which wow. is like some would argue is the same thing, but there's like <laughs> there's there's really it's really interesting. Um, I think Penn and Teller did a whole thing about it about like because it's it's what is several or like what is a few. Um, and mm. it's yeah, when does that change over? And uh, because there there have been times when there have been four of something, and I have been staring at it for so long. Because I can't tell if it's four or five. Like you, you just have those like complete, complete brain fog moments, especially if it's something that has like an odd shape, and you're like, mm. I know there are four, but I have to double check. Wow, wow. I think six is easier than five. I will say that. I think six, you, I can recognize. Well, more. that's because you know two pairs of three. Exactly. Exactly. There is a difference between, as you said, counting that quickly and recognizing what six of something looks like mm. but hey richard we don't have to worry about that because this year we're only covering franchises with count them two films currently <laughs> in each franchise and this fortnight we are heading over to the pixarian well that we have dipped our little toes and you shouldn't dip your toes in wells that people drink from there but uh yeah, we're, we're returning be dangerous to <laughs> yeah your you'll fall in there. idiot <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've done Toy Story before. We've done uh, Monsters, Inc. and Monsters University. Have we done any other Pixar franchises? I don't think. I think this is our third Pixar franchise. We have not done Cars. We No, we haven't have done not. Finding, yep. <laughs> the Finding franchise, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, because... Lucky, lucky though, lucky that we haven't done any more than three because then we'd just out, we'd have a complete mental breakdown and not know how to count uh, how many good. Pixar franchises we've done. Uh, but yeah, today we're going to be talking about The Incredibles, directed by Brad Bird, came out in two thousand four, and its sequel, Incredibles two, also directed by Brad Bird, which came out a whopping twelve years later. Fourteen. In 2018, 14 years later. Yeah. In 2018. Yeah. Yeah. If it had um, been three, you would have been able to just look at it. Exactly. The true testament to how my my brain completely shuts mm. down. If it's like the too thing high that you number. can't do, like some of the simplest maths known to man, but you're like, I reckon I could identify six by looking at it. This because counting. You can't, easy. AJ. You're insane. C- no, counting's a chumps game. I'm trying to act like it's impressive. It's the easiest math there is. Mm. <laughs> Math is math. That's an Incredibles reference. Math is math. They changed it. We can keep 
doing doing this. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is obviously um, a pretty big uh, franchise for us for our little franchise podcast. I feel like it's it's an interesting one because it's it's one of those definitive like. Uh, uh started became a franchise during the life of the podcast so when we conceived the concept it wasn't even really on the horizon realistically but also because incredibles 2 was a long gestating sequel probably is this the like longest time between pixar sequels i think it might be yeah yeah, so people were after this for for a long time, um, and they were always, you know, because because I think the Incredibles. We'll it was get always into this, like it, the go to answer for what's a film you can't believe never got a sequel. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and I think it's because the Incredibles is considered S tier Pixar, and mm. uh, for years and years you would hear the soundbite of Brad Bird saying, "Well, we're just waiting for the right story to come along." Uh, and eventually, it allegedly did. Yeah, so yeah. here we are to talk about these two according films. According to Brad Bird, uh, anyway. According to Brad Bird, <laughs> a bird <laughs> is such a beautiful last name for for like an artist to have, right? Like I feel like mm. it's a very artistic surname. But Brad, that's an accountant or an engineer, you know. Mm. Like his na- his name is in combat with itself, much like the characters in The Incredibles. Richard, what do you think that The Incredibles 1 has on Rotten Tomatoes? Uh, like 97, 98. It is, not, it is roughly 97, 98. You're correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be specific, it is 97. Um, yeah. And for all those kids out there who grew up and who were born in 2005 and haven't seen haven't seen this movie which is not unrealistic richard because that would make them like what 18 if they were see i can't do maths <laughs> if they were born in 2005 that'd so be, that'd you be know 19, but yeah there are full adults who haven't seen this movie yeah people who people didn't are grow voting. up with it people are voting people who year. are voting yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe these movies have a political bent. Maybe it's a political bent that uh, maybe the, these new 18-year-olds wouldn't agree with. Let's get into it. But first, what is it about for all those 18-year-olds who have taken a moral start? <laughs> to not watch incredible. any films from before they were born. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it's about a... Well, we, we open with uh, the height of superheroes. Like, they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're just... they. It's just a fact of life that superheroes walk among us. And this is in like the 50s, 60s sort of thing. And then Mm -hmm. uh, something goes wrong. A guy tries to kill himself and uh, our title hero, Mr. Incredible, uh, saves him from a suicide. He sues Mr. Incredible. uh, And then this starts a whole sort of litany of lawsuits against superheroes. And eventually superheroes are outlawed. Cut to 15 years later. Mr. Incredible has married another superhero named Elastigirl and they Mm -hmm. are in essentially witness protection. They're living normal lives. Um, Bob, aka Mr. Incredible, um, yearns for the the days of old. The Uh, the glory days. They've got a couple of kids now who also have superpowers, uh, Violet and Dash. Elastigirl is stretchy. Dash can run really fast. Uh, Violet can turn invisible and create force fields. And they have a baby who doesn't have any powers and uh something goes wrong at uh bob's workplace and he ends up uh, losing his job but and instead of relocating he is able to stay because he gets a call he gets the call to adventure um from mm. a someone uh, mirage some, some mirage a mysterious someone uh and so he ends mm. up sort of moonlighting doing hero work on this island in the middle of nowhere uh when it's revealed spoilers for the incredibles that the mastermind behind this um getting him to do this like quote unquote hero work is actually trying to kill him and he's been killing a bunch of other superheroes and his name is syndrome and he is actually the young boy who i didn't mention from the prologue who <laughs> wanted to be i was gonna say Mr. you're Incredible. going for a b plus on the synopsis, synopsis at best because you forgot to set up uh, buddy <laughs> um yeah and so yeah it turns out that it was this kid who we saw in the prologue as wanting to be his sidekick and so he's resented superheroes his whole life and he's got this plan to build this robot have it take over manhattan or you know the 
the financial district. Oh, there is a name. Yeah, it's mentioned for the, the city. It's one, a f- yeah. It's like San Urba. Incre- Bill's City. All right, Metroville. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and then because he can control the robot, um, you know, he'll have it take over. He'll pretend to be a hero, and everyone will love him. Uh, the family ends up working together and saving the day. Mm. Yep. So, are uh, you, you, and I? I assume I know I've seen this dozens of times. I mm-hmm. assume you have seen this dozens of times. This is a last day of year eight. They play this on the CRT TV kind of movie. Um, you know, like I feel like I probably have seen this movie ten to twenty times in my life. What about yeah, you? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> same sort of thing. And. Watching it, I started to remember all the like DVD extras, and I'm pretty sure there were yeah. um, <laughs> Easter eggs on this DVD as well. Uh, that like I remembered all all of the stuff that I've seen because mm. yeah, watch watch you know very much a Pixar house got growing up. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's me too. My my house too. Richard, what did you think of The Incredibles all this year? Do you agree that it is um, top shelf Pixar? So uh, I, I've got an interesting sort of relationship with The Incredibles. Like I, I remember. Um, all the sort of ones before this, Pixar films before this, um, my whole family went to, or like I went with my mom or like my sister, my mom, my sister or whatever. And this one I remember seeing like a Saturday morning with my dad. And it was the first one that, that like just us had gone to. And so mum mm. and Emily hadn't seen it for whatever reason. And I just remember it always being this like thing between my, my, me and my dad. That like, And to this day, anytime The Incredibles comes up, he will go, good movie that. And I was always just like, I just sort of saw it as that, yeah, like, yeah, it's a good movie, but I never really, and even as I watched it a bunch growing up, it was like, to me, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, um, Toy Story, Toy Story 2, they were like the Pixar movies. And it wasn't probably wasn't until uh, end of my teen years that I started to see a lot of people be like, this is obviously the best Pixar movie, right? And it sort of made me reevaluate it and- what I look for in a, and so I do consider it S tier Pixar now, but it took other people pointing that out for me to get that, you know? Mm. This is very interesting, Richard, because I think I have a contrasting story to you. And this is good radio, right? Like mm. this is what they taught the the students who studied radio at the school <laughs> we went to. Is like, even if you don't actually disagree disagree on here so there's something to talk about it's something for people to call in about um because i always considered this one of pixar's undisputed five star films but i gotta say yeah. re-watching it this time it just does not feel as fresh after a decade mm. and a half of cape shit and this is obviously mm. no fault of the movie and i still think it's probably better than most if not all marvel films but i didn't find it hit as hard anymore and the the uh the superhero stuff becomes deeply uninteresting to me now compared to like the family, the family. stuff and the character stuff which is all really great and i think that the the thing that still uh, that i think is still really strong about this is, is probably um syndrome as a character and as a villain mm. and i think syndrome's shadow hangs over the Incredibles as a franchise and in, 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 uh, more than, than one way uh, because I genuinely hate to take it here, Richard, um, and this feels like a say the line Bart kind of thing, mm. uh, but is, is this syndrome the best not- video game adaptation? <laughs> no, is, <laughs> is Syndrome not in the right? Like, not to fake a essentially a terrorist attack so that he like he's the villain that's mm. where you take it understandable that's the that's the marvel thing of ter- you know the joke that i always used to make about now i'm gonna blow up a hospital after freeing a bunch of refugees you know mm. uh, but like like his ultimate goal is to bestow everyone in the world with superpowers there's a very to famous quote it, yeah. yeah very famous quote from this film uh when everyone's super no one will be which is such a well-written line and i remember hearing that for the first time and just never forgetting it like every time i'd go back to this movie i'd think about that line but i mean that's a pretty close uh sentiment to like redistributing the wealth and things like like that like essentially mm. we are to take the side of the privileged in this film and when someone 
from what you could describe as a as a lower class to the mm. supers tries to come in and be like hey why don't we as you say democratize superpowers he is like the movie labels him the villain you know yeah i just don't like, think we should be like faking terrorist attacks for our own glory though aj of course and again that completely like that, like, that I'm sorry there to is take a safeguard it, but you know the aj that is like okay dude <laughs> this is more turning into the the other similar uh, buzz line, which is true communism has never been tried. <laughs> like this, this is one of these things where it's like, yeah, okay, he shouldn't have faked a terrorist attack, but uh, if someone else came along and was like, hey, let's make superheroes an accessible thing to everyone, even if you're not born with the power, like which is you can do that ethically. An interesting thing that I've never actually thought about is that we don't know any origin stories in the world of the Incredibles. Sure. Well, except for syndromes, right? Yeah, but like we, yeah, we don't know. We know that. Um, I mean, Edna in the second one mentions that like babies are sometimes born with mm. multiple powers, and then that gets like whittled down, I guess. Yeah. And we know that like the kids, even though they're different powers to what their parents had, they have like the superhero gene. So it's like I guess we're just like to infer that it's. It's more like a mutant thing um, to, to you know, yeah. use Marvel. Yeah, um, that it's it's a gene or it's a or whatever you know. So so I yeah I really want to talk about this because I think that the the mystery box in the film that is does Jack Jack have superpowers? Even as a kid, that was the only thing I cared about going into the movie was what's the fucking baby's superpowers? Yeah. Um, and it's revealed at the end that he can he basically has a myriad of powers. Including can, he's a, turning he's into a, a fireball, shapeshifter more than anything, Sh- yeah. shapeshifter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think maybe there could have been some smoothing out of the law here because, as you say, it's briefly alluded to in Incredibles two, where Edna, who's the fashion model who designs all the suits, uh, voiced by Brad Bird, fashion designer, not not a model. Oh, sorry. Well, you know, I I I think she's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she says that uh, baby supers are often born with more than one power, but Jack Jack is significant for quote having many, and I think they should have done this differently i think it should have been probably established in the first one that baby supers are born with every basically any power that they can will and Mm. as you grow older you sort of naturally begin to specialize on one of those till the others become out of your abilities right because i think that would also explain uh, why Violet has two powers, which is like never acknowledged in anything. No one ever talks about the fact that Violet can turn invisible and create force fields. And I guess that there's like a light bending yeah, element light that bending. maybe you could. But also, um, but- that's the invisible woman's power set from. Like the, correct. This so family is, is very is that- Fantastic Four based. Like you've got yeah. the the brute strength of the thing is Mister Incredible, Elastigirl Girl, obviously yeah. Mister Fantastic, a, a Violet not even trying to hide the fact that yeah she has two yeah. superpowers because they're the same. It's Dash is different, but then Jack Jack can flame on. Well, also like Dash might not be the same as the Human Torch, but like both characters can move really fast so it's mm. essentially the same same yeah. thing yeah um what like what do you think do, i reckon like like there could have been more of like a a discussion around jack jack getting his powers mm. uh as if it's like how we discuss kids like eventually getting yeah 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 or like how we discuss kids eventually getting chicken pox or their adult teeth coming through it's like you start you you get your powers there's too many of them and then you specialize on one as you get older and it's not really your choice it's just what you naturally and you become a hero or a sidekick yeah yeah this is is this just sky high (laughs) am i just describing sky Sky high High, (laughs) um would you believe, Richard, you did say this before, so it's not a perfect um, segue. Would you believe that this film is set in a retro-futuristic version of the 1960s? <laughs> because you know how much I love but secretly hate but secretly love to uh, do your least favorite thing, which is prove you wrong. Uh, yeah. But I remember a very yeah, explosive moment on the podcast, on the podcast yeah. a few years back where I sort of flippantly referred to the fact that The Incredibles is set in the 60s and you 
<laughs> responded like I'd said the earth was flat. Like you <laughs> laughed in my face and said, where the hell are you getting that from? And because I hadn't seen it in a while, I had to like double back yeah. and be like, well, I think I think maybe it's just sort of a stylistic inference. I don't think it's yeah, like explicit, but it is explicitly said. There's a, You see a newspaper in it with 1950s yeah. written on it. You, when um, Edna is talking about all the superheroes who got killed all of because the they had- because I was thinking about had it too. Capes. Yeah, she mentions like whoever, 51, this hero, 57, you know? Um, so, yeah, how does it feel to be wrong? And more importantly, for me to be right about something, something well, movie it, related as how well. How does it feel to have been wrong like, what, six years ago? AJ, yeah, I don't even uh, tell care. Me. I don't even care. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is your syndrome origin story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is how these things gestate, right? <laughs> yeah. And like, I yeah, reveal but- it to you. I've got you trapped. And I'm like, after all, Incredibles is said in modern day. And you're like, and I'm like Richard. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, but I think that's one of the coolest things about it, right? Is it takes these direct lifts from... 50s and 60s superhero serials and and spy it's very spy it's a much more of a spy movie at times than a superhero movie yeah it's actually a political thriller <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, and i think that's that's now become one of my favorite things about it and it has kind of this extra crust to it because it preceded mm, sort of like grown the superhero time. boom it's- this rock, it's got this gross, yeah. like, <laughs> crusty layer to it. It's got a skin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just developed a skin on the top of it. No, just, like, I think the fact that this came out before, I don't know, let's say Iron Man is the mm. line in the sand. Like, it has this freshness where its superhero genre, at the time anyway, would have felt like like more of a refreshing or interesting Well, this is the thing, is that it's like, it's a... Um, like broadly speaking it's like a subversion of like superheroes that it's like but then also this is a lot of what like stan lee brought to comics and stuff like that but it's like it's about the family dynamic but it's also a superhero movie um Mm. but now what we call like subverting the superhero thing is like you get things like chronicle you get things like brightburn where it's like Mm. what if Mm. the boys like what if superheroes but this but like because it's subversion is so like milk toast compared to what we're doing now. It's like um, it's so quaint. It's so quaint, but like the film is actually really earnest, and I think that's mm, like you mm. you kind of couldn't do that now. Um, you would need mm. to have a classic. There's no classic Marvel undercuts in this film. Like it's it treats yeah, yeah. the family drama and the superhero stakes with like equal footing, which is mm. so important to why the film works. I agree. I agree. Another thing that I think is really interesting about this film that separates it from a lot of even Pixar films, but like kids movies in general Mm. is like, I remember seeing this at 11 when I was 11 years old, not 11 PM. When I was 11 (laughs) years old, I saw this for the first time and thinking it was bonkers that the film featured an on-screen suicide attempt Mm. in a kid's movie. Like as a kid, I was like, you can't put this in a movie aimed at me because as you talked about before, it's like set during like a, what, it's like the, the, the trope of the, the accountant jumping off the yeah, high yeah, rise yeah. building during the stock market crash. Right. Yeah. Um, which I, I am to understand was a very 1950s <laughs> method of suicide, I guess. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Incredible saves him. And like when it happens in the film, it's like, was that a suicide attempt? And yeah. then afterwards it's like, these newspaper headlines which are all about uh, mr whatever didn't didn't ask to be saved mr i I love that the vocal performance from that guy he didn't ask to be saved he didn't want to be saved (laughs) it's It's great it's so uh, good yeah that is one of of like many things uh that amazes me whenever i watch the incredibles because on every subsequent rewatch it's pretty like let's say 
extraordinary uh, how totally unconcerned <laughs> with being a kids movie this is like yeah. the villains in this movie are bloodthirsty the the, the yeah. line that always stuck with me and i think is the best one of the best lines of the film is um when they've arrived at the island the kids came as stowaways yeah. so like helen didn't want them there helen's elastigirl um hmm. and she says you know the villains in those old saturday morning cartoons you used to watch they're like yeah yeah they go these bad guys Guys are not like those bad guys they will not exercise restraint on you because you're children and it's like it's such a mm. um it's such like a, not only is that like such an adult sentiment but it's also like an adult yeah. way of phrasing it that it's like yeah. like yeah. you know if you're if you're actually talking to a kid you'd be like they're not going to take it easy on you but like they will not exercise yeah. restraint because you are children is it's such a well written line and it's and it also like just mm. really drives home the stakes and like what we're actually dealing with here yeah and i think like it's a great example of i think if i was to ever write a a movie like a kid's movie Mm. the key really is to make it a little bit too edgy for the target demographic Mm. and i think and the incredibles is an example of a movie that really pushes it right to the edge of of what you can put in a in a in a yeah in a kid's movie because um there's also like like it's 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 and up has a similar thing where the character arc is about a disenfranchised old man like yeah. like like it's not about kids it's about a like what like 45 year old dad who's in a midlife crisis and misses the old days which is not something any of the children watching this movie have had a, even a taste of right mm. and i think that like that also feeds into a pretty heavily i say implied but it's really just outright said that helen thinks bob is cheating on her with mirage mm. and mirage is portrayed like pretty seductively as a character yeah, she is in too. the film you know so like it's not an unfair assumption to read into it to that he's maybe the, cheating know to want to have sex with this animated character um you know and and all these things it's it's so it's so is not placating to the children and i don't know if i necessarily noticed that as a child but i really appreciate that watching it as an adult because i think it's it makes it so much more interesting and timeless as well and and Mm. like like it's you can watch it at any age and feel the the proper intended impact of lines like you said um, mm. about not re- not restraining and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Speaking Do we want to address the, the what's the <laughs> elephant in the room? Presumably, you were going to say <laughs> I was going to. Um, you know, we're talking about sexy animated characters. Oh, of and course. Like, I, I don't want to. I don't want to like dwell on it. I don't want to be like that podcast but like that is part <laughs> of this film's legacy right mm. is that like mrs incredible is like she's our generation's jessica rabbit of like <laughs> that's great a, totally a character that is like un unnecessarily sexy <laughs> and animated Interesting. Um, well, it's it's a different. It's certainly a different uh, gaze of what sexiness is. I think probably a, a less problematic gaze than uh, Jessica Rabbit, right? Yeah, but sure. like, yeah, I mean, p- there's there's the trope of Pixar Pixar moms. Pixar mm. mom ass yeah. is like a is the thing now, right? Because yeah, and like, but like, why? Of course, of course, a woman who has a superpower where she can stretch would give herself like a a banging booty right <laughs> well but then she looks there's the famous shot where she looks in the mirror and checks out her butt and and the look she gives is as if like oh i'm getting old you know like this body ain't what it used to be but it's mm. like she can just stretch it to whatever she wants um yeah but presumably yeah. there's a comfortable <laughs> thing that requires no yeah um, no good question is it uncomfortable to stretch is it like a wolverine re- like shooting his claws mm. out kind of situation well, I know, where like, it hurts every time <laughs> there's one thing in to use the fantastic four as a um as a reference point um there's one thing that i i'm pretty sure reed richards can do and i think he does in the tim story movies but like change the distance between like the optics in his eyes to essentially have magnified vision which there's a few times i'm like helen you should use that um but (laughs) i remember at the start of um rise of the silver surfer the invisible woman gets a, a zit on her wedding day and she makes it turn invisible and she's like great now i have to concentrate on that spot for the rest of the day um 
So it's like what there a is like a piece of world building. <laughs> there, there is like an active use of the powers, um, which is yeah, an interesting thing. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I said this to you while I was watching it, but it's like Holly Hunter's performance as well is so good. Like that accent and mm-hmm. that raspy voice is so good, and I think that she doesn't get enough credit for like how hot Miss incredible is that like her contribution to that i did mm. <laughs> have you ever seen the video of um this is a like a gross thing i'm gonna say here just fyi um but have you seen the video okay. of um uh it's like these two girls and this one cup right and- <laughs> no, it's a it's an incredibles related thing it's like at disneyland or something oh. like that and they all come out in the costumes and you would think like oh because you know like um merida and like all the disney princesses they just have people that look like them but they have like these mm. giant fake heads for like all the incredibles so yeah, it's like it's so weird this inc- and then um <laughs> she she falls over down to her knees and just like the face plate of Mrs. Incredible just falls to the floor and and then she's like scrambling to cover her face and it is so fucking funny because underneath it's not like oh it's revealed the actual human it's like this they're wearing like some sort of balaclava I think so it's like just reveals this dark void and I think maybe the eyes are still in the same place so that's just how I'm remembering wow. it and it's the funniest fucking thing because of like how like specifically horrifying it would be to be a child in that audience that yeah. was not as disgusting I as do. i was expecting it to, to, to be to be honest yeah no that's why uh, yeah, it was more talk about existentially how hot- horrifying <laughs> yeah um speaking of incredibles in disneyland um i when i was in uh california a couple of years ago uh along with listener Vinny and my partner jess we went to um to Disneyland, Anaheim, and um, mm-hmm. we went to because that's where they got the California Adventure, which is all the where all the Pixar stuff is. And I was a very brave boy and did the um, Guardians of the Galaxy Tower of Terror Mission Breakout, um, mm-hmm. and that was like okay, I've pushed myself really far out of my comfort zone once for the day, and then we were going to do the Incredicoaster. Coaster for the record. Vinny was too scared to do Mission Breakout, and then. That was my limit, and but Jess was brave and went on the Incredicoaster, coaster, which is like the fastest roller coaster they have there or something. And she was sitting right at the front, and it looked very scary. And I think Vinny and I got shaved ice or something. I remember I got like a mango ice cream with um, like habanero sauce on it. It was quite nice. Yeah, that sounds. Better and I remember than, the people um... at the Incredicoaster, coaster. Yeah. The people are in front of us. Well, like, um, and I remember this thinking, like, this is a difference between Americans and Kiwis or most other places in the world. Like, AJ, say you want a mango ice cream. How would you order that? Like, I, you come up to the till and I'm, and you want a mango ice cream. Yeah. Say? I'd say, hey, can I get a mango ice cream, please? Yeah. They go, uh, they go, yeah, uh, I need a mango ice cream. <laughs> no, please. Not a question. Just a statement. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, and then, well... And then this was also I, not long after that. I think it was while we were, I was having my mango ice cream thing. We walked past um, someone who said, um, not only is that sus, but that's sus with your cousin. God, <laughs> that's <God>. right. <laughs> this, is, this is... I'm remembering all this lore now. Yeah. Um. One other thing we could probably talk about uh, with in regards to how grown up this movie is, um, is another line of dialogue that uh, I've remembered for a long time, which is when yeah. Syndrome discovers that the Incredibles have had children. My and he says, uh, <laughs> what does he say, Richard? Tell us. He says, Elastigirl, you married Elastigirl and you got busy. Oh, it's a whole <laughs> family of supers. Oh, this is just too good. It does like a random southern accent for it's the It's so that good. Final it's too good. It's Jason Jason Lee of My Name is Earl uh, and, voices uh, Big syndrome, Trouble of course. Fame. But um mm. yeah, he yes, was of one of my um Yeah, that was like a big running gag with my friend group the Oh, this is just too <laughs> good. When did my name um, is Earl run? I What? 
when did we miss oh 2005 it started airing because i was gonna say is this part of my like pixar theory that they it's you can tell like what was big on tv at the time by who's in it uh, you get that the second one because no, um you have um saul goodman bob odenkirk and also yeah. um, J- um jonathan banks i think that uh that jason lee was already famous from a few other movies oh yeah he'd been in all the shit, kevin yeah. smith ones no, that didn't come out yet either. Um, but yeah, that that line, I remember seeing that in the theatres for the first time and being like, wow, just an unambiguous sex joke <laughs> just mm. chucked in there. And a couple of weeks later, I bought The Incredibles comic book, like the a, a novelization, mm. a graphic novelization of the, the movie. And the first thing I did, I don't think I actually bought it. I think I just flipped through it in a supermarket and skipped to that part of the story to see if they'd still included yeah, yeah. the sex joke. And, and, and it was, and it was spelt B I Z dash Z A Y. Bizay. That is um, how you say What do you it, think? So. What do you think of the animation? What do you think animation- sex between um, the two of them would be like? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the animation quality of the Incredibles? Because uh, it's, it's dated. It's very interesting. It's dated, isn't it? It's very interesting to go back to these sorts of things and remember how they were lauded as like, you know, like Monsters, Inc. Like every single hair on Sully's mm. coat was animated individually and shit like that. And then you get something like this and it's like, it looks good if you don't hyper focus on aspects. If you look mm. too hard, things start to look like veggie tales, I think yeah it is amazing like how far we've come and i mean like there are aspects of this because like i think every pixar movie has pushed the boundary forward in in one way or another like you say like it was the hair and monsters inc and like um mm. the water physics and um the finding films and mm-hmm. yeah i mean a lot of it i guess is like the action in this um because it is actually like very well directed action um mm-hmm. and i mean brad bird would go on to make uh, mission impossible ghost protocol so yeah, guy knows what he's doing. Land. And Tomorrowland, and then he got put in director's director jail, and has only <laughs> just briefly left to make an inferior sequel to this film, and then is uh, seems to have promptly been put mm. back in. This is also Pixar's first uh, all human cast. I remember that being a big mm. thing at the time. Yeah, yeah. That that was the first one where just what normal people, had I guess, superheroes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it is also the only, I believe, Pixar film that does not have the Pizza Planet truck in it because the scene in which the Pizza Planet truck appeared was deleted from the final cut. Yeah, they just like forgot about it. Because hmm. people always tried to be like, no, no, it's it's there. Like you look at this and they're like, no, no, we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, well, let's move on uh, some 14-odd years, Richard, to um, another uh, Incredibles movie. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We are, of course, talking about Incredibles 2, released in 2018. Brad Bird, you know, he was like, I'll do it if it's good, and he apparently deemed this to be good. First one had 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. What do you think the second one has? I... I remember it still being, I remember it still being high-ish from when it came out, but like, uh, but that sort of thing of like, by Pixar standards, quite, I'm going to guess like 82. It's actually at 93. So like, wow. if a, if the original Incredibles was rated 93 on Rotten Tomatoes, I would have no, I wouldn't f- think that would be like unreasonable you know like it's a respectable score for any movie let alone a a sequel let alone a sequel that uh has honestly mixed reception overall it seems um what is incredibles 2 about so to picks up immediately after the first film um the first film ended with this new villain rising up called the underminer and then um they fight him they take him down uh but and you sort of think oh you know people are going to be happy that superheroes are back but that's not what happens uh people are still angry at superheroes because of all the like you know uh destruction that happened in the wake of stopping the underminer they get uh this guy winston dever and his uh you know nobody of a sister um show up and say you've what you've got is an image problem because you're saving these people but you need to be seen to be saving them and saving them in the right way is the the thing so 
we're going to, you come work for us and we will get superheroes back on the map. And they're like, sweet. And like, actually, you're too much of a, a renegade. You're too much of a loose cannon, uh, Bob Parr, Mr. Incredible. We're just going to get Elastigirl front and center for this. So she starts doing hero work while Bob is left at home with the kids. And so he has all the sort of like family drama. Um, this film, while Elastigirl goes on this thing and uh, takes encounters this new villain called the screen slaver who thinks that bloody society is addicted to their bloody phones uh and which won't be invented for another 30 or 40 years normal screen savers yeah <laughs> the, yeah exactly the uh, the the idea on which the villain's name is a pun of yeah so uh it turns out that this the screen slaver uh is evil endeavor oh, evil endeavor we've got a bloody even treeborn on our hands and uh yeah they have this she has this plan to outlaw superheroes again <laughs> um well because so so uh winston and evelyn's father mm. was like a, a a friend of the superheroes and was killed in a in a home robbery where he went to try and call gazer beam instead of going into their panic room. And so mm. while uh, Winston s- carries on his father's love of superheroes, Evelyn has been secretly resenting them this whole time yeah. and wants to ensure they are plunged back into illegality. But uh, the thing is <laughs> that her her villain plot, she would be better off have do- of doing nothing. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, She wants to maintain we'll the status it. quo, which is... On, on, on like on route to being maintained until she intervenes mm. yeah <laughs> yeah um so yeah there's a big thing with hypnotizing and goggles and um the, a big storyline about jack jack finally revealing his powers to everyone and learning how to control that edna who we've mentioned a couple of times that is truly the stance my, my my partner's favorite character was edna she actually wow, was watching the um partner. Who My actually, partner, might I she- say, kind of looks like Edna Mode for anyone playing along at home trying to trying to guess <laughs> anything about AJ's mysterious partner. I will tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, th- yeah, so um, my partner actually liked the second one more than the first one. I think they weren't really on board the first one until Edna showed up and then loved Edna so much that when she started... When we started Incredibles 2, she was like, all right, I'm ready. I'm down. I'm, <laughs> I'm not misgendering my partner, by the way. They're, they're she, they. I don't know if, if that needs to be specified. To be and she, <laughs> yeah. they sound like Edna Mode as well. <laughs> Same accent. Um, so what do, you, what do you think of this movie, Richard? You've talked a, a big smart aleck game about your feelings well, so far. But it's interesting because- I remember when, we, when you saw this, I remember texting you after I saw it and you being like, it's so good, right? It's interesting because I did like it at the time, but then I just mm. haven't really thought about it. And for like, I haven't watched, I haven't rewatched it since until I finished it less than an hour ago. But like- I, it is interesting rewatching The Incredibles and it's like, you know, watching one of those films that's baked into your DNA, you know what's happening in any good time. And then watching a film with the same DNA as that film, but now it's just a film that you kind of remember, you know? Um, Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just like, this is, it's not as good. It's, uh, it's a, it's a good film. I'll still give it that. And like. For where Pixar was at the time, I think it was still considered like a oh, you know, they they did all right. But I, th- there's a lot of stupid shit in this. Like it's just it's it's half baked compared to the first one. I think. Mm, I agree. Uh, yeah, and and what is actually now a case of bad radio? Um, I think I actually have the exact same uh, experience as you did. I've never rewatched this since seeing it at the cinemas, and I remember walking out of it being like, "Fuck, that was so good." I think thought that was really good, and then rewatching it for this time, I was like, "What was the thing I thought was really good?" And <laughs> yeah. like, it, it clearly didn't hit me again, right? Yeah, because cause, I, cause, I wasn't as jazzed by it. Yeah, when I would when I would think back to what I think of Incredibles two, I would remember thinking the screensaver was a bad villain, the screenslaver. Mm-hmm. I remember thinking mm-hmm. the evil evil endeavor twist was a bad twist, and. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then it's like, oh yeah, there's like uh, all this uh, comedy at home uh, with that that I've never the really. The comedy at home into. stuff's good. I, th- I think right, that that's yeah. that's that's fun. Um, I think it loses massive points for me because Screen Slaver is nothing compared to Syndrome. Yeah, um, who you know, S- Syndrome was was mine and a lot of other people's. I'm sure uh, first exposure to a sympathetic villain. Mm. It's such a complex motivation that you totally understand, like you sympathise. Whereas Screen Slaver, it's kind of like two separate uh, ideas that don't that don't ever meet in the middle. So yeah. she she is against screens and she wants superheroes banned because of her dad dying. Uh, and those things never. Well, I, I would each also other. throw in there that it, it's, it's a little bit more subtextual, but there is also like the, um, there's like a girl power element to it that it's like, okay. Like I, I do th- like it's, I, I, I like it as part of um, Helen's story. That like, and I mm. and I like the idea of she's the main character of the second one. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a few moments with Evelyn that just feel a bit like lip servicey, where it's like, oh, we're doing that. Like I'm evil because I'm a woman and I've been put down. Where it's like, like you say, you've got three different motivations that are like none of them are fleshed out enough to really be sympathetic. And so once you establish one or two and then be like, oh, it's also because women have it harder. It's like, it feels like, what, what are we doing here? You know, like, yeah, yeah. Make, make that her entire motivation or make that a stronger part of her motivation or like introduce mm. more of that dynamic with her brother and mm. stuff like, um, yeah. Yeah. Just the, my dad the, was killed by is- superheroes, but then also her dad was, yeah, yeah. died because of, the outlawing of superheroes um, because when he went to yeah. call Gazer Beam, th- they'd just been outlawed. Um, but then, you yeah. know, it's, it was his over-reliance on superheroes, I guess. But it's it's such a paper-thin villain for what, yeah, as, as you said, the first one is the best one. <laughs> a landmark. Yeah. 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 Um, I think the Devas are such strange additions, Winston and, and Evelyn, st- mm. such strange additions to this film because they feel like they should be these integral, important characters. Uh, and one of them is revealed to be the villain and my favourite kind of bad twist, which is people saw the trailer and predicted it would be her. Yeah. I think that um, I like when I certainly love Bob, Bob Odenkirk and I love Winston Dever as a character, but he doesn't really do that much. And Evelyn, she even looks like she's animated differently to everyone else. Like, mm. like I feel like the second one doubles down on like the very sharp profiles and like they're very mm. stylized characters. Whereas Evelyn looks like something from like a run of the mill Disney animation film mm. like she's not stylized in the same way that even Winston is yeah, yeah. and perhaps perhaps that's a clue that she mm. is untrustworthy but I would have just not if I was writing this movie I would either not make it a twist at least for the audience I would tell the audience right away because mm. if you've got these two characters and a mysterious villain who's not going to put two and two together and be like, well, it's one of these characters and they're certainly making me want to believe it's Winston. So yeah. it's probably not Winston, yeah, you know? Exactly. And I think that, that, that lets it down. That lets it down so much because uh, it's, it's not surprising anymore. Whereas like something like syndrome, I don't reckon I saw that coming at all. The first time I saw it. Wow. You're um, stupid. And it's, Wow, dude. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> well, I just well think syndrome it's, it's- when when syndrome is introduced, it's I am syndrome, the kid from your childhood. It's there there mm. is who is this mysterious benefactor, but you're never like shown him or like Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there is a, a video by Nando V Movies. There's actually a pair of videos saw. by Nando V Movies where he uh does it, it used to do a series called One Small Change? This is a video essayist, if people aren't aware, uh, where he'd take like a movie that 
had some flaw in it, work out what it was and suggest a change for it. And he, the first video from Nando V Movies I ever saw was I this sent one. It to you. And you sent it to me. And I actually think this is what happened in between me seeing it and loving mm. it and me watching it now is that Nando's fix for Incredibles 2 is so smart and so well thought out that it infuriated me that the movie did not do any of these mm. things because it was essentially him rewriting re-watch. the villain reveal correct i've i've jotted i've got some bullet oh, yeah. points if 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 you'd like um and i i do want to pause and say like i think it's pretty incredible ha huh, that like huh. a youtube video essayist is pulling this off compared to pixar screenwriters right like it's like this is better. This is so much better <laughs> than what The Incredibles 2 actually did. So Nando's big changes are as follows. He said that screen slaver should exist independently of slu- of supers so that it gives supers a reason to be legal again instead of in the actual movie, uh, The Incredibles collateral damage inspires screen slaver and inspires mm. underminer and inspired syndrome as well. Um, he also said to, that uh, to hide the Deva's tragic backstory a little more more and i agree i think that there's a scene in this where you first meet the deva siblings and they get into an argument about what their dad should have done and i think it's the weakest part of the film i think it's they behave so irrationally it feels like really poor character writing that's just desperate to give you some information in a non-creative way so nando was saying like don't mention that there's uh like bad blood about the decision the dad made make Mm. it instead that you find out the dad died in the circumstance um he said that screen slavers entire goal is to erode people's trust in screens and that screen slavers actions uh should cause people to not trust screens which causes the devas to lose money slash not have people watching the supers on tv so you don't suspect them because the plan is actually like in direct contrast with the devas plan by this point Mm. um uh, then when Evelyn is revealed to be the villain, she elaborates on the tragic Deva backstory. Um, after being revealed as screen slaver, she says that her dad was obsessed with cowboy stories and thought he could take on the Roberts, the robbers himself, and he gets killed. So now Winston is promoting the same ideology to the world that will get more people killed. So as their father wasn't big on supers, he was big on being a hero because mm. of cowboy movies. And she is now seeing a, a similar danger arising if superheroes are getting put on screens again. Yeah. Um, and it tackles the idea on a meta textual level that superhero movies infantilize adults. She's, he's, he's saying, Nando's saying that should be at the center of it. And yeah. he has a part two as well where he sort of rewrites the ending and it's really good. He, he makes it so that like... Uh, the the final moments are like the citizens of Metroville helping Mr. Incredible take down the Underminer and that there should be a scene where when Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl get hypnotized that they have to fight the kids and like all these like scenes that feel so obvious that they mm. should be in the movie so like like these are the these are the toys in your playground. This is the obvious thing you do with them. Well, go, I won't reiterate all of the videos, but go watch them because I've never. I don't think a movie has ever fallen from grace for me more than Incredibles two mm. after hearing someone f- fan fiction. Yeah, it, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I so good I'll videos. go a bit more into because there's a few things that I was like wished had happened in this film that will be my pitch for Incredibles 3 in just a moment so I won't go into it here Mm. but uh Mm. yeah um I I also with Incredibles 2 I got a bit more of the um made to sell toys kind of thing um Mm -hmm. Elastigirl gets a new suit that's not it's her original Mm -hmm. suit but it's slightly different and it feels and she gets an Elasta bike and yeah, a lot of those things are like, you know, it, it, like it, why, it's why Spider-Man has a new suit in every film, um, especially mm. like the the, um, the Sony ones, because um, Sony has the toy rights to the for the films or whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. Or no, Marvel has them. Yeah. But anyway, that it's like they want to sell more toys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, I don't want to sound like I hate this movie at all. I, I love that. I love the like Bob having to be a stay-at-home dad shit. I love the... Um, it's kind. It's a, maybe you could argue it's a little out of place in the movie, but Jack Jack fighting the raccoon, just as like a mm. like 
standalone short film i think it's it's so funny and just yeah, yeah. the like animation is so terrific in it but it probably would have been better as one of those weird short films that pixar includes like on their jack, DVD jack special attack. features like jack jack attack you're a big um, jack jack attack guy the other thing i'm sorry to not even let you answer <laughs> that but the the other big thing i'm pretty sure from the incredibles is that was the one that bounden was the pixar short film beforehand right ah was it let me double check. Um, bound, 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 and rebound. You yeah. find that you're up, Ryan. Um, I also sky. think, yeah, like, was it? Sorry, it was ahead of, of the Incredibles. Bounden is my favorite Pixar short film. There that you played go. Before one. Nice. I fucking love it. It's direct, written and directed by Bud Lucky, and he voices the narrator, um, who's mm. the voice of Rick Decker, who died in 2018 and is replaced by Jonathan Banks uh, for the sequel. But um, Bounden right. fucking rocks, man. It's so good. Yeah, man. <laughs> I agree. It's 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 probably one of my favorites as well. Um, I think like despite the devas not being interesting characters, I do think this film introduces some fun new characters. Like there's the whole new class of superheroes. There's one called Reflux who can burp fire and he looks like a frog. Like mm. all of that shit is entertaining. I'm here for it. I love it. Yeah. Um, but I do want to talk about something that we talk a lot about on this podcast, Richard, and that is titles. We talk oh, about yes. titles a lot on this podcast and never has a title scandal felt more appropriate for me to dissect. This feels like a case study that was designed for this podcast because uh, the big difference between the two films in, in terms of titles is the first one's called The Incredibles and the second one is called Incredibles 2. So it, it drops the the, as Justin Timberlake uh, would put it. Um, and I saw, like, there's, there's a clip of Brad Bird sort of flippantly dismissing this and just saying he thought it would be weird to call a movie The Incredibles 2, which everyone around him, yes, man, it's like, yeah, 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 mm. even though, like, what? Why? Why would it be weird to call a movie that? Um, and, like, we we have watched a lot of sequels that drop the the from the original film's title, right? Like, Avengers Age of Ultron is a sequel to The Avengers. Terminator mm. 2 is a sequel to The Terminator. I believe we haven't watched these for the podcast, but... Tr- the transporter then transporter two transporter mm. three is one that always bugged me growing up i can accept all those other ones as just being me being in my own little weird brain about it but this one's different and i saw an awesome tweet from some somewhere i can't find again so sorry <laughs> to whoever pointed this out because i can't back it up but the, the point still stands is that by removing the the from the sequel title it destroys the joke of the title that the mm. the incredibles is the superhero version of saying the joneses or the martins the fact that the surname is the word incredible it subverts this familiar technology a te- terminology while also indicating that they're superheroes right so mm. Uh, it's a joke. It's a because it's like you've you know you know the Joneses, you know the Martins or the Smiths or the Wilsons or the Browns. It's a Get ready American to dream. Wicket white picket fence family. Now the Incredibles. You know what I mean? Like there's a joke mm. in that title that is completely dependent on the word the coming before it i think because Mm. if the first one was called incredibles i don't think you would think it's referring to the family i think you would think it's referring to supers like supers are called incredibles you know and so yeah i think that this is a time when it's appropriate to be persnickety about incidental title changes for sequels because (laughs) i think this movie obviously should have been called the incredibles 2 and by removing the the it tells me that we fundamentally don't understand the gimmick of the whole the Mm. the, like conceit of the whole franchise you know yeah what would you call what do you think um like if it wasn't two what would you if like a subtitle or like a the Incredibles versus the Screenslaver? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to come up with anything amazing on the spot like here. What can, I, um, I think the Incredibles two would have been fine, but like, like I don't what, know. Is, the is there anything that, you, that like can? Yeah, the Incredibles return, but like the like is there any sort of like expression that keeps the like it feels like a family expression? I mean, if it was like, um, you know, they go somewhere else, like the the Incredibles on holiday would be a mm. 
a good format for a title. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm not I'm not here this time to pitch a different title beyond the Incredibles uh, two. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, but that always really frustrated me. Um, so yeah. But speaking of uh, sequels and sequeling, we are going to move on now to continue the franchise, which is a segment where we pitch our own continuations to the franchise. But before we do that, uh, it is worth going over a few other continuations of The Incredibles. There has been, as you might expect, a myriad of uh, comic books and short films, including Jack Jack Attack, as we said before. There's another one called Mr. Incredible and Pals. There's one that came out after Incredibles 2 called Auntie Edna, and a couple of episodes of Pixar Popcorn which is like their little minute long short film series they did for Disney Plus there's one called Chore Day The Incredibles Way and Cookie Num Num Um, but probably the most significant sequel we had to The Incredibles before uh, Incredibles 2 came out was a video game called The Incredibles Rise of the Underminer so as you mentioned before at the end of the first film it ends on like a cliffhanger where like a subterranean mole man drills out of the ground and is like prepare for I am here to, to steal the land of the, the surface the surface dwellers for I am the I Underminer I was beneath you the- but nothing is beneath me I remember my dad <laughs> having to explain that to me because I didn't know what being beneath you know nothing is beneath me right nice um and one of our many 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 two unpaid and another example of how now i can't even count to two (laughs) uh, two unpaid interns uh vincent lara he used to do this when we did our uh, patreon show no it wasn't it was just a regular show called meeting of the elders uh we'd get him to play the video game tie-ins to our latest franchise and he'd give us a little review so he's written us a review for the incredibles rise of the underminer on ps2 do you have it in front of of you? Would you like to read it? He didn't send it to me. Ah, oh, he sent it to Cop Popsha. Oh, well, I haven't been getting... Actually, no, do you know what? I got a new phone and I must not have mm. logged into Cop Popsha. You didn't tell me you got a new phone. Yeah. I feel like that's significant enough of a thing to tell your friend about. Well, do you know, because I shot my 48 hours film on it. And I didn't want you to be like, oh, Richard fucking shot on his iPhone. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> um... But yeah, I got a new phone to shoot my 48 hours film on it. Um, anyway, and I haven't logged into Cop Option because I've been like, has AJ just been like sniping? Because like whenever <laughs> you com- you comment on Patreon, we get a notification. So normally like when I when we put a post live, you know, uh, Franchise Poll or uh, the Home Improvement Offers, it like, it would just immediately just email, 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 email. But sometimes, not always for some reason, if like AJ opens it before I do, the notification will disappear. And I was like, man, AJ must be so fucking quick off the mark. I'm on top of my game. For like the last week. Because I have not been getting any cult pop emails. But now I realize it's because I haven't logged into it on my new phone. (laughs) Hmm. Well, anyway, uh, Vincent. So he says that the, a summary of the of the game is when the evil underminer rises to surf to the surface with a sinister plan to rule the world. It's up to Mister Incredible and his super cool pal Frozone to save the day. While Mrs. Incredible, Violet, Dash, and Jack Jack take care of things topside, Mister Incredible and Frozone race underground to put a stop to the underminer's dastardly plans and bury the diabolical baddie once and for all. Um, so it, he says that he started playing at 7.30 p.m. and got the best credits roll at 9.44 p.m. So yeah. not a very long game, it sounds like. It says it opens with footage from the end of the movie. Rest of the Parr family have zero lines and are, off, and are taking care of miscellaneous drills around the city the entire time. Bob and Lucius, uh, who's Frozone, jump down giant hole to chase Underminer. Before the city are layers and layers of factory that Bob and Lucius have to fight their way through. Underminer miner on a loudspeaker gloats about his plan it is an invention called magnemizer a, a device that will ruin the earth's magnetic poles and destroy everything topside i feel like that's a better plan than what his plan is <laughs> in incredibles 2 um, the plan is for Bob and Frozone to go layer by layer and smash everything in sight to stop the machine. When the magma- magnemizer is destroyed, Underminer goes to plan B to use an army of robots and one giant robot he pilots to lay waste to the surface. One robot, Doug, befriends you because they are not evil. Another Pixar Doug? Yeah. Before Up? Um, 
They just want to be left un- alone underground. Mocks how dumb Underminer, Underminer is, how all he did was kidnap scientists and force them to create his entire filth facility. He has no idea what how to do anything because pressing this besides pressing the start button. Uh, Doug points to the t- two towards the scientists and they are rescued. Giant robot fight on the top side of in the rain is the final boss. Game ends with the robot blowing up. Blowing up. Bob yells out to his family. Group hard credits roll. Vincent says, my review, it's a meh licensed beat-em-up with bare bones combat and platforming. Nothing special, but could be fun with a co-op partner. At least it came out a year after the movie, unlike some other sequel. Mm-hmm. So, there's Rise of the Underminer, a sequel I was always curious about and now am fairly uncurious about after yeah, yeah, reading yeah. Uh, the, the review. Curiosity's been whetted. Hmm. Uh, in terms of Incredibles 3, following the release of Incredibles 2, director Brad Bird acknowledged that the film's truncated production schedule resulted in many plot lines and ideas he had for the film being cut from the final version. Um, he blames Toy Story 4 and Incredibles 2 switching places, it's meaning they lost a whole year of production. Mm. Um, so supposedly these linger- lingering plot lines could lead to a third installment. Um, he said there were lots of ideas that we had on the film that could be used, whether it's another Incredibles film or something else Samuel Jackson who voices Frozone and Sophia Bush have expressed interest in reprising their roles um, and producer John Walker has said I would, wouldn't ever rule it out and if past his prologue it'll be another 14 years and a lot of people will probably need oxygen to make a third one Just I think that it will not take 14 years I think we will get an Incredibles 3 within the next 3 to 5 years because Pixar wow. I think they even announced it recently that they're they're starting to look at ideas for Incredibles three because I don't Disney's in the crapper man they're they're pulling well, out Pixar's every stop just they laid can off like fourteen percent of their staff. Great! What an awesome company that I worship. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, yeah, what's your idea for Incredibles well, three, Richard? Something didn't come up, um, but talking of um, like deleted plot lines and stuff, I'm sure you would have seen this, but um, the like alternate intro for um incredibles where it's them no like, i haven't seen it what is it it's like it's it's presented on the dvd as an animatic you can probably find it online and it's them like at a barbecue and i remember the main thing i remember about it is that like bob is like um slicing some carrots or something like that and then ends up like cutting his hand but the um the knife just like perfectly molds around his fingers, but then some random notices and thinks he's cut his fingers off. So him and Helen have to be like, Oh, Oh no. And he like covers his hand. It's like, nobody look. Oh no. And it's like, you know, fully um, voiced and uh, yeah, like an animatic. And um, I, I can't remember if that's the only thing that happens or if there's like some other thing that like gives away their secret identity or whatever. But then it's like, that was their first attempt at uh, relocating, and now they've had the time jump to them now. At, you know where we see them in the film, mm-hmm. and it was kind of just like adds mm-hmm. a double beat, so we don't need it. Um, but it's quite interesting. I, yeah. I, I remember it being quite a, a good little short little idea. The other thing that I remember that was cut mm-hmm. is that um, uh, when Helen calls to get a plane, she calls her old friend Snug. Um, who's like, yeah, I'm calling cool that Fabio. I mean, we never see him. We see a photo of him. And then cut to she's flying the jet. Originally, it was going to be that Snug was flying the jet for them. And he, so he was going to be killed in the crash. And what remains of that is there's like, when the fuselage falls down, so the, the um, Helen and the kids are in the water and the, the the plane is sort of crashing down around them. And as the like yeah, the 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 uh, like the nose of the plane sinks, there's like this lingering shot of her looking down at it. And it's kind of like mm. a it's it's an interesting shot because it's kind of like, oh yeah, like, you know, why is that shot in there? But it's because that shot was animated when it was her watching her friend's body sinking. Um, but I think they just took it out for it being too dark. But that shot stays stayed in there. Wow. Uh, but wow. anyway, is that your Incredibles three? <laughs> <laughs> my idea for Incredibles three is my. If you'd asked me in 2017, this was my idea for Incredibles two, um, mm-hmm. because I I had heard this as a rumor somewhere or whatever, and it took me so long to be okay with Incredibles two when I found out it wasn't this. Um, 
but I I would have preferred to see the time jump. Like, mm-hmm. it's cool to, you know, people are like, no, I need to see what happens to the Underminer. I was never curious what happens to the Underminer. I assumed it was a joke character. Well, and we would just time yeah. jump to the actual time that has passed in real life. But I'm so much more interested by uh, uh, Dash, who's, what, like, in college or leaving college. Violet, who's, like, trying to make her own in the world as a young adult, mid-20s or whatever. And- a 14 year old angsty jack jack who was just getting a hold of his powers and the rumor that i heard or dreamt or whatever was that jack jack was going to be the primary villain of incredibles 2 that he was going to go mm. off the rails he's the most powerful incredible um and that the family would have to sort of come together to stop him without you know hurting him or killing him or anything like that and i'm so much more interested by that as a story than than seeing the very next day you know like you can do they defeated yeah. the underminer and superheroes are legal again in the prologue cut to another 15 years later because there's a 15 year time jump at the start of the first film um but yeah i was like it took me from when it was announced and it was announced we're not doing a time jump to watching the film like i, I spent that whole time trying to come to terms with being disappointed that I wasn't seeing a time jump because also just like with animation as well, I think I'm more interested to see like uh, new character models for like aged up characters. There's also like, mm-hmm. that's a part of it yeah. rather than just saying, Oh, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. still the same. Yeah. Cause they had to recast the voice of dash of course, mm. because he was played by Spencer Fox, um, AKA the guitarist from one of my favorite bands, Charlie bliss. Um, wow! In the first there film, and now he's and now he's played by some kid in the second one, <laughs> and I'm sure he'll be played by some kid in the third one when they once again don't do a time jump. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think that's a really good idea. I think that Jack, if Jack Jack was the villain of Incredibles two, I would be like this franchise does the best villains. Like it feels mm. like it feels like the same weight as Syndrome, even heavier maybe. Yeah, you know? like, imagine Jacob Tremblay. You can't be playing. Yeah, yeah. Jack Jack is the villain. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, I agree that we need to go a little bit into the future now. I understand the desire to keep the characters the same age for two, but like we've seen that now, and you can always do m- mid quills and things if you want to mm. go younger again. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, all the things you said, I'd love to see all the other kids grown up. Um, I feel like it could tie in. At first, I thought, what if it tied into the 1969 moon landing? Fuck like, I was trying to think of interesting American landmarks. Trying but to screw think of funny that. Years. Let's take it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take it into the 70s with a fictional 1970s Mars landing, right? Like the famous. Okay, yeah, yeah. The famous Mars landing of 1970-whatever, mm. right? And so it's a 70s set Incredibles film. So have you can have fun with every, how everyone's dressed and and what's being referenced and things like that. I think that would be a cool aesthetic to try and like create a retro-futuristic style for. Um, and by this point, I'd realized I'd created uh, Incredibles in Space, which I don't think is a bad title necessarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe it's got aliens in it. Maybe Interesting. aliens are the so- villain. You've kept you, so you're dropping the the. Uh, I think I'm at a battle here of if you've dropped the the from the second film, it's too late to pick it back up. Even though I prefer mm. it was just kept intact the whole time. Um, but the Incredibles in space, I will also accept. But um, one like I feel like the character of Bob Parr is the most interesting when they're digging into how he is uh, dealing with like the world changing around mm. him right i think that's that's what flexes the character to make him his most interesting and his most desperate you know is is uh and and like I, the 70s well the end of the 60s is thought by historians i think to be like when we like people started to wake up to how grim the world was, right? Like we had Vietnam, Vietnam and JFK got killed and and all these things that felt like Wait, what? America was living through this age of prosperity in the 60s. I didn't even know JFK was sick. <laughs> well, and the, yeah, exactly. And, and the Beatles died as well. All wow. of them died in the 60s. Uh, yeah, so all of that I think is super interesting. So why not combine that with another metatextual commentary on the genre richard what if incredibles in space is thematically about 
everyone has superhero fatigue. It's not mm. it's not they d- think they should be illegal anymore. It's that um, Syndrome's plan was eventually put into action. You can now buy stuff that makes you a superhero and mm. now everyone's super and now no one is and people don't care about it anymore. They're it's interested like the, in um, other things. Jurassic World pitch. Yeah, yeah. But but like literally saying superhero fatigue in yeah, the yeah. movie to be like, it is acknowledging yeah. this problem while treating it like a real thing. And and I guess, and, and this feels like what Toy Story 4 is about, which is about like, what do you do when the thing you thought you were made for no longer needs you? You know, mm. what do you do then? And I think that would be an interesting place and an interesting motivation to go to space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's my Incredibles 3, Richard. And that is the episode for the fortnight. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. We'll be announcing our next franchise in, in just a moment. Uh, but before we do that, um, if you enjoyed you this podcast, please franchise? consider following us. Oh, we need to rank that franchise, of course. So over at letterbox.com slash uh we have what we like to think is our our best our best section of the show, <laughs> uh, which is where we rank every franchise we've ever watched. And we're going to rank now the Incredibles and Incredibles 2 on our FFF ranking. Uh what do you think? Give me, so this give is our me 198th a, no, franchise. And we haven't done anything to celebrate, Ooh. but this is, by some metrics, maybe our 400th episode of the podcast. Wow, great. Wish we had knew that beforehand. I um, told you last week, but then I forgot. Ah, uh, true. Sorry, I forgot to write it down. Um, so we have something called the Nymphomaniac Constant, which is where we judge if a movie is more good or more bad, or a franchise is more good or more bad. I mean, surely Incredibles is a net positive franchise. Oh, absolutely. Right? So, interesting. So, so in, the Nymphomaniac Constant is currently at 99. Um, mm. So. Well, it's about to be at 100. <laughs> yeah, but interesting, it's going to be like the halfway point of the list. Like, you I know, think it, that's probably very, uh, des- by design, we've made it the middle of the list, right? Yeah, but <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, like it's interesting that because quite often it's been, uh, there's been a lot more below it um, and stuff like that. But yeah, it's actually coming mm, to. Mm. We have actually been covering about half as many, you know, about the same amount of good and bad franchises. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Anyway. Um, I'm going to throw to you that we should rank The Incredibles. Okay, I found Monsters Inc. I think mm-hmm. as far as Pixar duologies go, The Incredibles is better than Monsters Inc. and Monsters University. Would you yeah. agree? Yeah. All right, so let's go up a bit more. We've got the Shrek franchise at 28. Do you think that the Incredibles duology is better than the Shrek franchise overall? Because I, I don't think it is. I don't think it is either. Um, below that, we've got Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Below that, we've got Train Spotting. I think it's better than Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. You think it's better than Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? Well, let's yeah. put it there, buddy. At number 29 is Similar our ranking for- film in a few ways to Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. I remember like, when we watched Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, I talked about how it's like a lot of um, like baby's first screenwriting, that like the way things are set up and paid off. And, and my, my least favorite parts of The Incredibles are when it does stuff like this, like how many times in the final fight they realize and then tell the audience that the remote controls the robot. And then- Oh, it's the worst part of the movie. And, and, and like, and they have a moment of realizing this and then it flashes back to earlier in the film. And it's moments like those that are like, you are watching a kid's film. Remember that, okay? Mm. When we've gotten all this like darker Never stuff fucking before. fucking forget. <laughs> and then like- <laughs> oh, wait, the only thing strong enough to penetrate it is itself. And then I, I hate, for some reason, the line at the end where um, Syndrome has Jack-Jack up in the air and Helen says to Bob, throw something. And he goes, I can't. I might hit Jack-Jack. And she's like, wait, throw me. Bob, throw me. And I, I don't know, just something about like her realization of it and then the pause and then the repeat. It, it, yeah, it's- it's very like spelling it out for the audience, and I, I don't like that. Yeah. One fun thing about our ranking, Richard, is we've ranked it at number 29 with Shrek at 28. And uh, the poster for Shrek and the poster for The Incredibles are the exact same thing. They are both mm. what the bigger character front and center with the sidekicks 
either side of him with a burst of flame behind them that they're running towards camera away from. Like yeah. they are almost exact. They're almost identical in composition. They mirror each other. Yeah. Next to each other. Yeah, yeah. It's like poetry. Uh, also, that's 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 super fun so anyway yeah follow us on fucking instagram and twitter and all that bullshit jump in the discord tell us what you thought of the incredibles jump in our patreon if you want to uh tell us what movies we have to watch and richard the next fortnight we're coming up to our what eighth year mm. anniversary of the That's podcast, right. which means we do a little thing called Redux where we revisit a franchise that we've covered before. Um, and because we're doing two film franchises this time, we said to our patrons, hey, give us a two film franchise we've covered before. And they voted. And I believe there is a clear cut winner. Well, it's, it, it's a little complicated, actually, because on we have Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, Um uh, you know, which is always sort of the underdog and always just misses out. But then one point above that, uh, we have uh, something here. Ian Sterner has suggested Nympomaniac, which is not a word, um, certainly not a franchise we've ever covered on the podcast. So, I, like, I don't want to... I don't want to, you know, put words in other people's mouths and assume to know what Ian was meaning because, you know, like I, I would look at that and I would think, oh, it's similar enough to the word nymphomaniac, which is, you know, a famous sort of franchise we've covered. We'll cover that, but I, I don't know, AJ. Like, like, do we, we assume that's what he meant? This. this is so unfair. This is unprecedented podcast tomfoolery, the <laughs> likes of which we've never. This is a stunt. Well, that's we've what, never unpre- that's what unprecedented means, AJ. Yeah. It was a redundant well, sentence. <clears throat> well, I'm a pretty redundant guy. Yeah. So. Not I- as redundant as you though, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. I guess, um, I guess we'll, we'll assume then, Ian, that you meant nymphomaniac. And um, for our, what, our second to last um, redux, we'll be doing nymphomaniac. Our second to last one? Yeah. Is that an official announcement of our our <laughs> uh, cancellation by the network? Yes. You reckon? You reckon we don't have two more left in us after this? We do. We have one more in a year's time, and then a year after that, mm. we'll do Star Wars. Oh, okay, tantalizing, Richard. <laughs> you're you're making me excited uh, to not do this anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, speaking, sp- we just talked about the Nymphomaniac constant, and it's been like, like when I think of Nymphomaniac as a franchise now. I only think of it in terms of where I've ranked it on my silly little letterbox list. Mm. And so maybe it's time to revisit this. What if it's, what if part two's all right? Mm. You know, I, I kind Trier, of want maybe- to um, track down the, the full cut of both films and watch it as one. Mm. That'd be interesting. But yeah, stay With, tuned like, next week. We are redoing. Pornography still, uh, still in it. Reduxing the Nymphomaniac uh, duology, Nymphia- Nymphomaniac Volume One and Nymphomaniac Volume Two. I'm not sure how excited I am to return to these, but uh, here we go. This is what Redux is for. Mm. Thank you very much for voting to all our patrons, and stay tuned for the post-credit scene coming at you after this music ends. Richard, um, it's been incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome along to the post credit scene, everybody. This is a section at the end of each episode where if you donate $5 or more over at patreon.com slash Popsha, you get to give us something to talk about in this, the post credit scene. Richard, who's it from and what is it? Uh, today's one comes to us from Jake, who says, what's your favorite riddle? Oh, I got a great one. Oh, yeah. Light on me, babe. I've probably told you told you it before. Um, a man walks into a bar and goes up to the bartender and says, Can I please have a glass of water? The bartender pulls out a shotgun and aims it at the man. The man looks at the shotgun and says, Thanks, and then leaves. Why? Why to all of it? <laughs> uh, pause here if you want to take a guess. Um, here's hiccups, right? He has the hiccups, correct. No. So he got a fright from the shock. He asked for a, a glass of water to cure his hiccups and got a fright when he saw the shotgun. I 
uh, I know, like I used like I'm good at riddles, like things because I just know all of them. Like any <laughs> riddles like that, I've I know the answer somewhere in the back of my brain, or I um. I, I've read enough riddles that I can work out and I know how riddles are written kind of thing. Um, th- it's not my best, it's not the best riddle, uh, but this is just the one that's always stuck with me um, because I used to, there was like a website I would go on, which was like, you know, riddles and I would read all these. And I remember that I would read them like too late at night and I would, they would freak me out because they were all about like, they are freaky. They were all about they, dying. This, and riddles are stuff scary. Like, Oh, he hung himself on a block of ice and then it melted. Shit like that. Um, Yeah. But there was one, the one that always stuck with me because it's just so ridiculous. Um, And to be fair, I think it's supposed to be asked in a way where like you ask me a bunch of yes or no questions sort of thing. Um, So the riddle is a guy goes into a restaurant, um, orders albatross, takes one bite and then goes into the bathroom and kills himself. Why? Well, Richard, from context clues, I know that uh, obviously this man had been shipwrecked on a desert island (laughs) and was made to eat human uh, under the guise of being told it was albatross. Uh, Then when he got rescued, went to try albatross, for some reason could buy to eat albatross, uh, discovered that he had eaten human and couldn't bear to live with the <laughs> the guilt. Ah, uh, yeah. What a fucked up riddle. Like, what a riddle that Because I, I, I remember telling you, you that. I'm, I'm glad you remember that. That's really funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah the, the other elements with that, like, oh, yeah, there was shipwreck. There was three of them. His wife died and the other person died. So he ate his wife was the other big. That's yeah. why he killed himself. Um, so much but yeah. inferred story. It's so funny how that gets passed off as like a brilliant riddle, and it's actually just like a little bit of a story that you, you know what it'd be. It'd be a good, it'd be a good in media res opening to a film or whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure. I also, but it's um, not a, it's it's too ambiguous on its own. I think. Yeah. Speaking of um, riddles, though, I have been fucking obs- and Jess has been actually as well obsessed with um, Tom Scott's lateral podcast. Oh, yeah, man. It's great. It's so good. It's so good. I, I keep seeing clips on my TikTok and I have to scroll past them because then eventually yeah. I will listen to that episode and then I'm like, yeah, yeah. ah, fuck, I've, I've, I've heard four best, out of the five riddles on this episode already. Best one I've s- seen recently is what did famed mathematician Who's he, What's It uh, do that made his uh, mostly religious village pray 30% less per year? Oh, yeah, you seen yeah. that one? Yeah. That and one's it was, great. And um, I, because he introduced a 10-day... Um, a 10-day yeah, work week, which reduced work, the um, amount of Sundays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there we go. Uh, check out check out Tom listening. Scott's lateral podcast. It's, it's all... Um, yeah, they're like mostly true stories that are the same sort of thing of giving you not quite enough information and then... Well, it's... Um, it's it's lateral thinking, right? So yeah. you can solve it without needing to do mm. any research. Basically. One that I was listening yeah. to today that I actually knew already, I was very proud of myself, was that like in the Philippines, you can buy um, an alcoholic drink, which has one shot of rum for $6, two shots of rum for $5, or three shots of rum for $4. Why? How? I don't know. Tell me. It's um, the drink because it was like first you work out what the drink is um, and the drink is it's a rum and coke and it's because um, coke is more expensive than rum in the Philippines because it's like this high import <laughs> thing. Nice. 